Okay, so in the last lecture, we talked about the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, and we said that basically uh, it takes those three centuries nearly after Christ lived on the earth, died, was resurrected, and ascended according to the Gospels to finally come to the standard mature Christian understanding of the nature of God. Again, the vast majority of those who identify as Christians and churches are going to affirm the conclusions reached at Nicaea and that can be found precisely in the Nicene Creed, which we read especially in its beefed up version that came a few decades later in 381 at the Council of Constantinople. So for Christians since Nicaea, for the vast majority of them, God is the Trinity. So to be more precise, when saying God, Christians should be referring to the Trinity in its entirety, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinct, eternally existing divine persons that simply then are the one God of Christianity, okay? Then if Christians want to speak more specifically of a member of the Trinity, they should specify by saying God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to turn our attention to the most important council of the 5th century, which happened in the year 451. It's the Council of Chalcedon, and this is the subject of chapter 3 in Mark Knoll's book, Turning Points. And here, rather than focusing on the nature of God, we're focusing specifically on the person of Christ. So Jesus Christ as the incarnation of the second member of the Trinity the incarnation of God the Son. And the doctrine that gets established through the Council of Chalcedon is oftentimes referred to as the doctrine of the dual nature of Christ. Now, there will be a little bit more diversity following this council than there was following the Council of Nicaea. At Nicaea, Arius was pretty roundly defeated and considered a heretic. And while certainly there were pockets of uh, communities that affirmed Arius's understanding of the Trinity, the members of the Trinity sharing unequal glories. They were relatively small and largely dissipated within a couple of centuries or so of Nicaea. Here we're going to see a little bit more in terms of people not signing on to the conclusions of the Council of Chalcedon, and those people will establish their own kind of separate churches that will continue to exist to this day. So a little bit more diversity, but still the vast, vast majority of Christian churches since 451 have affirmed the doctrine coming out of the Council of Chalcedon. So again, the issue for this council is primarily related to the person of Christ. So look with me, uh, if you have your book there, at the beginning of the chapter on page 60, where you see at the very beginning of the chapter, Noel says on May 23rd, 451, the Roman Emperor Marcion summoned an ecumenical council of bishops that he hoped would end disputations and settle the true faith more clearly and for all time. So once again, rather than the religious leaders themselves calling the council, we have the emperor calling the council together just as Constantine did for the Council of Nicaea. Again, maybe Marcion really cares about the doctrinal dispute concerning the person of Christ, but more likely, he's probably concerned about the division that seems to be growing in uh, Christian communities within his empire. And just like Constantine, he may have really been focused on maintaining unity in Christianity in order to help stabilize his control over the entire empire. So if you skip a sentence, it says about 520 bishops attended, all but four from the eastern section of the Roman Empire. You had a couple from North Africa and a couple representing uh, the Bishop of Rome, who was Pope Leo I at the time. So again, this is largely, just like with Nicaea, a council that is attended by bishops in the eastern portion of Christianity at that time. And as Noel tells you, uh, continuing into these pages, the Eastern form of Christianity, the Greek speaking form, was always a bit more speculative and a bit more concerned with uh, the specifics of Christian doctrine. Whereas the Latin speaking Western portion, while certainly being concerned with theology, maybe didn't go to quite the same lengths of theological dispute 
that led to some of these tensions that required councils in order for those tensions to be settled. Uh, if you look further down in that first paragraph on page 60, the last five lines of the paragraph, it says basically here was the primary question. If Jesus was fully divine, which was settled at the Council of Nicaea, how was he human? And if Jesus was both human and divine, how did that humanity and that divinity coexist? So the idea is really the conclusions in Nicaea paved the road for the Council of Chalcedon, right? If Jesus must be viewed as fully and essentially divine, which is what Nicaea tells us, that Jesus was the incarnate form of the second person of the Trinity, and therefore Jesus himself was divine. If that's true, then how do we also talk about Jesus being a human? Because it seems that divinity and humanity don't really go together very well. The words we use to describe divinity seem to often be opposites of the words we use to describe humanity, right? Divinity, God, is all-powerful. Humanity is really marked by weakness. God is self-sufficient, lacking nothing. Humanity lacks things, needs things. Again, shows that weakness. Divinity is unchanging. Humanity is constantly undergoing change. So again, there seemed to be a bit of a logical or rational tension here between the divinity and the humanity. And Christians always had wanted to affirm the humanity of Christ. There were some very early groups that maybe questioned his humanity, and we'll see them more later in the course when we get to the McGrath volume. But by and large, Christian leaders wanted to affirm that he was truly a human being. He was not just a phantom or some sort of illusion. He was real. He was a human. He was born. He walked the earth. He suffered. He died and was buried, right? All that language that shows up even in the Nicene Creed. And yet with Nicaea, he is divine. So how do we talk about divinity and humanity coexisting in the person of Christ? And while this might get a little bit simplistic, um, I think it's important just to look at the overarching kind of positions that were present that led to the Council of Chalcedon. Noel gives us this chart on page 63. I always find it a little bit confusing. So I'm going to kind of present the material in my own way, and then we can look back at the chart and see if it makes more sense. So to get us close to the Council of Chalcedon, I wanna focus on the more extreme versions of some of these different views concerning the nature of Christ. So we're gonna start by talking about Nestorian Christology. There's a paragraph at the very top of 65 where Noel talks about Nestorius, who is uh, eventually the Bishop of Constantinople in 428. And even though Noel talks about some of this similar view earlier in the chapter, in pages 63 and 64, it's really Nestorius who is going to, as Noel says, precipitate much of the controversy because the language he used seems to bother others who view the person of Christ from a different perspective. So let's just look at this paragraph. The, the, the dispute, this is the very top of page 65, between Apollinaris and Theodore initiated a great eruption of controversy that spread over the whole first half of the fifth century. So again, Within a few decades after the Council of Nicaea, we're really getting to this next controversy where we're digging into the person of Christ, trying to figure out how to think of him as divine, which Nicaea affirms, but also as human. Okay, skip a sentence. Although scholars still debate what Nestorius's exact views were, he appears to, move, he appears to have moved beyond Theodore's position to strictly divide the humanity of Christ from his divinity. So what I want you to think about when trying to understand Nestorian Christology, which became more accepted in and around the city of Antioch. And remember, the Bishop of Antioch was one of the original four patriarchs of Christianity. So this was a very important center for the Christian church at that time. For Nestorian uh, Christology, whatever else we say about Jesus, we have to affirm that Jesus has two natures. I kind of put some blanks in to kind of keep you focused on filling in your notes, but again, add a lot more notes than just filling in these blanks. But Jesus must be seen to have two natures. He must be seen as human, but also divine. He possesses a human nature, but also a divine nature. The concern, and this is the concern really for everybody in this debate, is you need to be careful that the weaknesses of the human nature do not threaten 
the perfection of divinity. Nestorius's answer, again, Noel says it's a little bit tough to know exactly what he meant, but if we take it maybe to the extreme, which will be at least more helpful, even if it's not perfectly accurate for these particular individuals' views, the basic idea is that in order to avoid threatening divine perfection with human imperfection, you need to separate the two natures from each other. So the idea we get sometimes from Nestorian Christology is that you have the human Jesus kind of walking around throughout his life, and then the divine nature, right, that logos that we talked about back from John's gospel, L-O-G-O-S, the word, that divine uh, a presence, sort of hovered over the human Jesus. And the idea for the Nestorians is that when it was time for Jesus to do something godly, like walk on water or raise Lazarus from the dead or perform other miracles, the divine nature would enter in and sort of take over the person of Jesus so that the divine action could be performed. And then as soon as it was performed, the divine nature would exit and then would still just be hovering over the human Jesus. So that way, when Jesus is walking on water, he's divine. But then when he's hungry or tired or thirsty or experiencing weakness or suffering or change, then it's the human nature experiencing those things, not the divine nature. Because the divine nature is not defining the person of Jesus in those moments. It only takes over when it's time to do something godly. So again, the idea is trying to protect the divine nature from the imperfections or at least the weaknesses and change of human nature. Okay, That's the idea for the Nestorians. Okay? The problem, and this is really emphasized then by the opponents who represent a monophysite Christology, mostly centered in and around the patriarchal city of Alexandria, is that the Nestorian picture, especially when taken to a bit of an extreme, even if that's maybe misunderstood, is that it seems to compromise Christ's divinity, his divine nature. Because it seems that Jesus, as he was walking around for the vast majority of his life, was not truly and essentially divine. It makes it sound like the divine nature was kind of external to the person of Jesus, only entering into him at certain moments. But then it seems that Jesus, for most moments in his life, was not actually God the Son, was not the second person of the Trinity. No, the divine nature hovered over what was simply a human being. So that was the concern with Nestorian Christology, is that by trying to protect the divine nature, the two natures were so separated from one another that it seemed to compromise or shortchange the fullness of Christ's divinity. Okay. Now, the monophysites then are the ones making that argument, and they say, look, whatever else we say about Jesus, we must affirm that Jesus is one person. Okay. Again, this is going to make more sense here in a second when we see the ultimate compromise at the Council of Chalcedon. So for the monophysites, mostly living in and around the city of Alexandria. Jesus must be seen as one person. In other words, who he was has to be who he was at every moment of his existence. We can't have Jesus who is human most of the time, divine sometimes, and then the divine nature separates out, right? Mark Knoll, if you look down at the bottom of page 65, look at the last line on the page. To Cyril and other Alexandrians, it seemed as if Nestorius and his kind were presenting a nearly schizophrenic Jesus with two persons hardly relating to each other at all. Right? So he's using kind of modern psychoanalytic language to describe this criticism. So the idea for the monophysites is that the Nestorians are basically creating a schizophrenic Jesus who is human most of the time, divine sometimes, but almost seems to be two separate persons. Right? The monophysites say we can't have that. Nicaea tells us that Jesus is fully divine, which means he has to be divine at every moment of his existence. Divinity can't just be something that enters into him occasionally. Jesus has to be one integrated person. However, the monophysites are still concerned with 
blending the two natures too closely to one another, which therefore would threaten the perfection of divinity. So their solution is more to argue that at the incarnation, right, when God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, enters into the womb of the Virgin Mary, what happens is that the divine nature replaces the internal human nature of Jesus. The idea for the monophysites is that the concern is not so much the body. The concern is the heart, the will, the emotions, the passions, the mind of humans. It is those things that lead to temptation and sin. So if Jesus is going to be fully divine, he cannot possess those human internal aspects. So for the monophysites, the divine nature replaces that center of the human being, the soul, right? And with the soul, we kind of think of words like heart and mind and passions. That way, the divine nature is not threatened with the seat of human imperfection, that human seat, that center of human imperfection. The problem, of course, according to the Nestorians, is that the monophysite view compromises Christ's humanity. Because for the monophysite view, the only thing really left about the humanity of Jesus is his flesh. Because the mind, the heart, the soul, those things have been replaced or absorbed by the divine nature. But for the Nestorians, that means that you don't have a truly human Jesus. And if you don't have a truly human Jesus, then how can Jesus stand in for our human nature? Right? How can he provide that bridge between our humanity and God the Father? He needs to be both divine and human, which is why they always emphasize that he had to have both natures. So the monophysites, perhaps, when taken to an extreme, are seen as threatening the fullness of Christ's humanity, just as the Nestorians seem to potentially threaten the fullness of Christ's divinity. Okay? There's another word that becomes very important here. Let me type it on the screen here. The word is uh, theodikos. Okay, I'll just take that back up so we keep all this on one page. If you go back to that page 65 uh, and look back up at the top and look at the last six or seven lines of that first paragraph. Early in his bishopric at Constantinople, Nestorius preached a particularly controversial sermon denying that Mary was theodikos, the bearer of God. He asserted that Mary did not give birth to God. Rather, she gave birth to the human Jesus, whose humanity, though united with the divine logos, must be understood as separate and distinct from his divine nature. From this point on, Theodokos remained a center of debate. If you look then at the last five lines of the page, before where we read just a little bit ago, in response to Nestorius's proposals, including the refutation of Mary as God-bearer, Theodokos, came an immediate and thunderous counterattack from Alexandria. Okay? So there was a debate centered on this particular term used or not used to describe Mary. Was Mary the bearer of God? Did she bear God in her womb? And the Nestorians were arguing that no, we should not refer to Mary as Theodokos, because she gave birth to the human nature, not the divine nature. Again, they're wanting to kind of keep these natures separate so that we don't have to say things about the divine nature that are inappropriate when it comes to divinity. For example, the Nestorians might say it's inappropriate to say that God passed all bloody and gooey through Mary's birth canal and was crying. It might be inappropriate to say that God pooped his diapers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can go throughout his entire life. Right? Therefore, when Mary gave birth to Jesus, she gave birth to the human nature, and the divine nature, again, was kind of hovering over. The monophysites from Alexandria say, no, we have to affirm that Jesus, at every moment of his existence, was divine. And that means, even as he was passing through the birth canal of Mary, he was God the Son. And therefore, Mary did bear God in her womb and give birth to God. Right? So that became kind of a flashpoint of this debate when trying to think about how to understand Jesus in terms of his divinity and humanity. Both groups wanted to affirm that Jesus was in some sense divine and human. 
It was how to make sense of that. The historians tried to make sense of it by keeping the natures very separate from one another. This seemed to potentially shortchange the fullness and essential divine nature of Jesus. The monophysites tried to affirm kind of both things by saying that the divine nature replaced some of those internal human elements in the person of Christ, therefore allowing him to be one integrated person. Okay. Now, eventually, the groups come together at the Council of Ephesus in, uh, uh, in the year 431. And this gets described over on page 67 in the first full paragraph, which is basically halfway down the page. It says, after Nestorius promulgated his Antiochene views from Constantinople, and Cyril of Alexandria went on the attack against them. So again, you have the Nestorian view um, centered largely in Antioch, even though Nestorius was by this point the Patriarch of Constantinople. That was the fifth patriarchal city added once Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Emperor, Empire over to the east. And then you have Cyril being a primary representative of the Alexandrian view. So you have both of these figures fighting it out. The next step was to try to get the warring sides together. Again, we need unity. The political leaders seem to recognize that. So call a meeting and bring them all together. This was attempted at a meeting at Ephesus in 431, whereas it turned out both groups were well represented. Yet the outcome, had not the issues been so serious, would have been comic. Feelings between the supporters of the Antiochene, or Nestorian, and Alexandrian, or Monophysite, positions ran so high that the two groups could not meet in the same place. They refused to meet in the same room with each other. And so the bishops representing the two opinions met separately in different conclaves. The result? They excommunicated each other. So you have the Nestorians meeting in one room, and they basically say, we're right. The other side is pushing something that is dangerously bordering on heresy, or perhaps is heresy. Therefore, they need to be excommunicated if they won't agree with us. The Monophysites meeting in another room come to the same conclusion about the Nestorians. So the two sides walk out of their separate meetings, basically both proclaiming that the other side is no longer part of the true faithful Church of Christ. Okay? Noel says if it hadn't been so serious, it would be comical. Okay? The stalemate prompted the emperor to get involved. In an effort to pacify the dispute, Emperor Theodosius II took the side of Cyril and banished Nestorius. And then if you read the next couple of paragraphs, basically this is what happens for the next 20 years before we get to the Council of Chalcedon. Emperors get involved and they choose sides. And this emperor said, I'm gonna side with the Alexandrian view that we have to affirm that Christ is one person and we have to be very concerned about anything that compromises the fullness of his divinity, which seemed to maybe be happening with the Nestorian view. So I'm going to banish Nestorius into exile. Then another emperor comes into place and flops over to the other side, flip-flops, and says, no, we're actually going to bring Nestorius back and we're going to banish monophysite theologians from the empire. So this goes on for 20 years until finally we end up having the Council of Chalcedon in 451. But one very important thing happened before that council that proved to be very significant. Leaders in the East, in and around Antioch and Alexandria, wrote letters to Leo, who we already mentioned was the Bishop of Rome at this time. And they asked Leo to offer his opinion about this issue. Again, primarily these were Eastern bishops and theologians having this dispute. The Western Latin speaking Christian leaders weren't overly involved. Leo, however, does take the time to respond and he responds with what is called Leo's tome. T-O-M-E. That's the letter that he writes back. And in this letter, G uh, Leo comes to the conclusion that Jesus must be viewed as one person with two natures. In other words, he's kind of seeking a middle road, right? Remember, the Monophysites say that you have to affirm that Jesus is one person. They felt that the Nestorians we're creating that schizophrenic Jesus that separated Jesus's nature so much that it's like he becomes two separate persons. The Nestorians were arguing that he had to be seen as someone who possessed two natures, and they worried that the Monophysites shortchanged 
the fullness of the humanity by removing the human will, the human soul from Jesus. Leo basically says you're both right in what you affirm, but we have to therefore affirm both things, not just one to the exclusion of the other. So monophysites, you're right. Jesus is one person. We cannot have this schizophrenic Jesus. Who he is must be who he is at every moment of existence, of his existence. And if Nicaea tells us he's divine, that means he has to be divine at every moment, including when he was being born of the Virgin Mary. So Leo does affirm that Mary should be seen as the God bearer. But Nestorians, you're also right. Jesus, in terms of who he was at every moment, a moment of his existence, has to possess both natures in their entirety, right? We can't separate out the essential internal elements of Jesus's humanity, leaving only his flesh. No, he has to be fully human and fully divine. So the kind of catchphrase from Leo is that Jesus is one person with two natures. And what's interesting is to see how he reaches that conclusion, how he reasons through this conclusion. So let's look here, last couple little sections we'll look at. Page 69, the first full paragraph. Leo's response to Flavian, which is referred to as his tome, took a forthright position on the Christological question. Jesus was a single person with two natures. Roots of this wording went back to Tertullian, but Leo here amplified them with careful grounding in scripture and careful application to the present quarrels. So just like the ideas that were decided at the Council of Nicaea, we don't want to say that they come out of nowhere. Certainly there were others earlier in church history who seemed to anticipate this kind of conclusion, that Jesus must be fully divine and fully human, but both always at the same time as one integrated person. As had Athanasius in the debate over Christ's divinity, Leo emphasized how much the question of the humanity and divinity of Christ bore directly on the hope of salvation. I really want you to focus on this. This is really interesting. Remember the primary argument used by Athanasius at the Council of Nicaea against Arius was the logic of salvation, right? That this wasn't just about semantics, that Jesus has to be fully divine. Otherwise, the Christian hope of salvation is lost, Leo makes his argument that Jesus must be one person with two natures in the same way. He says this isn't just about semantics. This is about the message of salvation. Only if Jesus is fully God and fully human, all at the same time, can salvation work. Okay, so keep reading. Uh, Thus, the birth of Christ, and this is a quote from Leo's tome, came about so that death might be conquered, and that the devil who once exercised death's sovereignty might by its power be destroyed, for we would not be able to overcome the author of sin and of death unless he whom sin could not stain nor death hold took on our nature and made it his own. That divine nature had to take on our nature and make it his own. That's the only way salvation can occur, because you need someone with the power to defeat death, and therefore you need a divine person, but you also need someone who's going to defeat death for the sake of human beings, and therefore you need someone who has taken on the nature of human beings. In addition, Leo added careful statements about the ways that it was appropriate and the ways that it was not appropriate to say that human and divine attributes were exchanged in Christ's single earthly person. Here he was addressing the complex question of the communicatio idiomatum, the interchange of attributes or qualities, right? So how do we talk about the humanity and the, the divinity, both fully always present in the person of Christ? Is there still a way to keep some distinction between the two? So is it proper, for example, to say that God died, or God pooped his diapers, or God suffered, or God bled? Or is it proper to say that the man, Jesus, knew all things, right? So is it, is it, how do we talk about the humanity and the divinity? In his tome, Leo walked a tightrope that many before and since have fallen off. He says, each form of Christ as God and human carries out its own proper activities in communion with the other. With these words, Leo kept together distinctiveness of nature along with unity of person. So again, 
Yes, there are things that we say specifically about the divinity of Christ, but that doesn't mean that the humanity is somehow not present or shortchanged or compromised. And yes, there are things that we need to say specifically about the humanity, but that doesn't mean that the, the divinity is somehow not present in those moments. Somehow you need to walk this tightrope, Leo says, of recognizing the distinction between the two natures within the unity of the person of Christ. In some ways, this is very similar to what happened at the Council of Nicaea, where we end up seeing multiplicity within unity. Father, Son, and Spirit, how many gods are there for Christians? One. Something very similar here. Again, don't use Christian math in your math classes. Leo says that Jesus is 100% divine and 100% human. And yet, Jesus is one whole person. In math, 100% plus 100% equals two whole. This is one integrated person. And yet both natures are fully present while still maintaining some distinction in the midst of the greater unity. Again, this is some of the toughest stuff we're going to do throughout our discussion of Christianity, but it's so important. So by the time you get to the Council of Chalcedon in 451, Leo's views have a lot of weight at this council, as Noel tells us. And they really help the council compose what comes to be known as the Chalcedonian definition. So this shows up over on page 70. So just like we did with the Nicene Creed, this is another creed, even though it's often called the Chalcedonian definition. It's a statement of the faith, and it was agreed to by most who were present. Not all, but by most. And it will come to define the way most Christians since that time have understood the person of Christ. And you can hear in this definition how closely Leo's position is being followed. So let's read it together. Uh, this is page 70, the middle of the page. So, following the saintly fathers, we all with one voice teach the confession of the one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the emphasis on him being one. I'm not going to create a schizophrenic Jesus here that looks like he has kind of multiple personalities, um, and that he ends up being two separate persons. No, he is one and the same. But then also listen, he is the same, perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity. Right? There's more than a story in emphasis on the two natures of Jesus. He's perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity. He is the same, truly God and truly man, of a rational soul and body. Remember, the monophysites were maybe arguing that Jesus' humanity was really limited to his body, right? The definition is going to say, no, he was fully human. So he wasn't just a human body. He also possessed the rational soul. That's the meaning here for those internal elements of Jesus' humanity. So the divine nature didn't replace the human soul. No, he maintained complete human nature. He is consubstantial with the Father as regards his divinity. You can see the word there, that same word that we talked about with the Council of Nicaea, homoousius. So he's of the same substance with the Father in terms of his divine nature. He's also homoousius with us as regards his humanity. So the same word is used. Right? Just as he shares the same substance in terms of his divinity with the Father, he shares the same substance with us in terms of his human nature. He is like us in all respects except for sin. Some people hear that and they say, oh, well, then he wasn't really like us. Well, remember, sin, according to Christianity, is not an essential part of human nature as it was originally created by God. Right? So to say that we are sinful would be saying that we are less than fully human because it is something that takes away from our full, original, intended human nature. So Jesus' humanity, because it is not sinful, is actually more human than ours. So that doesn't make him less human. It doesn't compromise his humanity. Right? Sin compromises our humanity. Okay? He is begotten before the ages from the Father as regards his divinity, just like Nicaea says. He is the eternal God the Son. And in the last days, the same for us and for our salvation from Mary the God-bearer, the virgin God-bearer, so you can see that word being used in the definition as regards his humanity. He is one and the same, Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten. There's the monophysite emphasis on the unity of his personhood. 
acknowledged in two natures. There's the Nestorian focus, which undergo no confusion, no change, no division, no separation. At no point was the difference between the natures taken away through the union, but rather the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person and a single subsistent being. Right? So again, there's, there's still the distinction of the two natures as they come together to form the one person. This is really confusing stuff and it's going to be argued about to this very day. But we'll get some key words uh, from this Chalcedonian definition, depending on the translations, right? Some will say that in, in the Chalcedonian definition, it is said that the two natures are united, but not confused. Right? Distinct, but not separated or divided. So it depends on the translation of some of these terms. So in other words, the two natures, the divine and the human, they are united, but not confused not confused to the point where the potential for human weakness and change threatens the perfection of divinity. There's still a distinction between the two natures, but that distinction doesn't lead to their total division. United but not confused, distinct but not divided. Right? One of my favorite lines in the history of Christian thought, especially about this topic, actually showed up back in the fourth century from Athanasius as this debate was really starting to uh, take place. And he was talking about this moment in the Gospels where Jesus encounters a blind man. He takes some dirt in his hand. He spits in it, creates some kind of mud, wipes it on the eyes of the blind man, and the blind man can see. Right? And Athanasius, trying to think about how these two natures are present in the person of Christ at every moment of his existence, says Jesus spat in human fashion, but his spittle possessed divine power. In other words, it's like he's saying that it's not appropriate to say that God spits, right? That's the human kind of action. But in the spittle was the divine power. So it's a way to keep a kind of distinction between the two natures, but see how those two natures are always working together in union in the life of Christ. Right? That's what the Chalcedonian definition is trying to put forth. Right? It concludes... He is not parted or divided into two persons, but is one and the same, only begotten Son, God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? I'll go back to this page 63, and we'll kind of end with this, looking back at this chart that Noel gives us. Again, I find it always a little bit confusing, his word flesh versus word man dichotomy here. But now that you kind of understand these two positions, maybe in their extremes, but that makes it easier for us to see where the debate truly was. Hopefully this will make more sense. So look on the left-hand side. This is the Alexandrian side, so what we will call the monophysite side, okay? The emphases, right? You can look at a couple of them. The unity of Christ, the deity, Mary is the God-bearer, potential pitfalls, right? Does the humble carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth, disappear? More importantly, does Jesus lack a true human soul and so lack identity with the human race, right? That's the concern. That's why Leo said he has to be fully human in order to relate to humans and redeem humans. Right? That's why that's so important. You need to make a note of that, that when Leo's trying to make sense of this, he knows that he's maybe putting forth an idea that doesn't make perfect kind of human, logical, mathematical sense, but it's necessary for the message of salvation. He has to be fully divine for the reasons Nicaea tells us because only someone who is divine can defeat death and offer eternal life. But he also has to be fully human in order to relate to and redeem humanity. And that's the concern with an extreme Alexandrian or monophysite view is that you lose part of the human nature in the person of Jesus. The flesh is there, but the soul, the reason, the mind is lost, right? Because they wanted to avoid the divinity being threatened by human weakness and change, but still, if you lose that, you lose the potential connection for salvation. Right? The extreme expression, if you look further down, comes from Apollinaris and others who claim that Christ is not fully human because he had the word in place of his human soul. The divine nature replaced the human soul. Right? The extreme Alexandrian Christology after Chalcedon, you have that monophysite view, it continues with others. And then you look at the bottom, the modern adherents, who are usually more moderate. So we don't want to paint these groups as going to the extreme monophysite views. And here you see the Oriental Orthodox churches like the Coptic, 
uh, Armenian, Syrian, and Ethiopian churches. So when you think about the Coptic Christians, primarily in Egypt today, there is often a kind of moderate monophysite view. And those churches uh, and some of those people, they flow from groups that did not sign on to the Council of Chalcedon and therefore are independent from kind of the vast majority of churches that did sign on to the Chalcedonian definition in 451. Okay? If you look on the right-hand side, the Nestorian view, you can see the emphases. You emphasize the duality. You em emphasize the humanity, and you deny that Mary is the God bearer, or the is the God bearer. Instead, she is only the man bearer. The potential pitfalls, right? Do you lose the unity of the person of Christ, right? Does the divine power seem to be something external to Jesus, not fully and essentially who he is? The extreme position is Nestorius. I hold the natures apart, but unite the worship, right? Then you have at the bottom, the modern adherents, more moderate, of course, the Church of the East which exists to this day and holds to a more moderate but Nestorian view where there's still concern about language that talks about Jesus as one person because they're worried that that blends the two together too much. Now, I will say that in recent decades, you had leaders of the more monophysite leading churches, the more Nestorian leading churches, and the ancient churches like the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox churches that accept Chalcedon all come together and issued a statement where they basically said their agreement was far more significant than any minor disagreements. So there's been a more recent acknowledgement that maybe there was a lot of misunderstanding going on in the fifth century and that the different groups really weren't as far apart uh, as they were made out to be. That people kind of kind of held on to these specific phrases and made too much of them, whereas ultimately maybe these groups were just having different ways of saying generally the same thing. So while I don't want to make too much out of this, I don't want to suggest that according to most Christians who accept the Chalcedonian definition, Coptic Christians are heretics or anything like that. No, there's generally a recognition that the agreement is very, very significant and covers a lot of territory but there's still concern over certain words and phrases because of really where it might lead if it's not understood in the correct sense. So again, just as with Nicaea, where it takes three centuries to come to the mature standard Christian view of the nature of God, with the Chalcedonian definition that happens in 451, that means it takes more than 400 years for Christians to come to the standard mature understanding of the person of Christ. And it won't be accepted by all, but it will be accepted by the vast majority going forward, that Jesus must be seen as one person with two natures. He must be 100% divine at all moments, right? This can't just be some sort of power that enters into him occasionally, because only someone who is fully and essentially divine has the power to defeat death and offer eternal life. But he also has to be 100% human, right? Not just the flesh, but the internal elements as well, because only someone who is fully human, who fully knows what it's like to be tempted with sin, right? Who fully knows what it's like to experience the change of being human and the weaknesses, the needs, can truly relate to humanity and ultimately redeem humanity. That's kind of the mysterious doctrine that gets established at the Council of Chalcedon. And just like the doctrine of the Trinity, it will be considered a mystery of the faith. So it's not something that you need to maybe understand on a human kind of logical, rational, meta, uh, uh, philosophical level. The idea, again, is that our minds cannot always understand the infinity of God, and that includes the person of Christ who was God and also human. And at some point, you just have to accept what has been revealed through Scripture and the voice of the church, even if it doesn't make perfect human sense to you, right? That's what the church will say about these various mysteries of the faith produced in these early councils. Okay. So again, another long discussion here, but I hope this sort of makes sense and it gives you the ability to think more precisely about the way Christians understand the person of Christ. And just as, with, as I said with Nicaea, if you can kind of understand some of these things, you understand a very essential doctrine in Christianity better than 99% of the people who go to church in Cedar Rapids every Sunday. Most of those people are not going to know about 
the Nestorian and Monophysite Christological debates in the fifth century. They're not going to know very much about the Council of Chalcedon. They're not gonna know about the concerns that are present if you fall off that tightrope that Leo helped us find of viewing Christ as one person with two natures. And if you talk to a lot of Christians, you can pretty quickly hear things that maybe would be concerning to some of these figures, right? When people maybe emphasize Jesus' divinity so much, right? He needs to be worshiped. He's up on a pedestal. He's so unlike us that they perhaps tend to forget that Jesus was also like us. He was human. He was like us in all ways except for sin. And by forgetting that connection, it ends up threatening the way they understand the salvation offered through Christ. You have others who maybe emphasize Jesus' humanity so much that you perhaps threaten the view of his divinity. This stuff still happens in the way Christians speak about things to this very day. That's why it's so important as scholars to try to really understand Christianity as it develops, rather than thinking we understand Christianity just because we know a few Christians or because we've maybe visited churches here and there. Because chances are you're not going to get this kind of theological understanding uh, in those circumstances. Sometimes you will, not always, okay? So uh, we'll move on to uh, the next chapter um, that we're going to discuss in Noel for the next discussion, but that concludes our uh, conversation about the Council of Chalcedon and the doctrine of the dual nature of Christ.